Okay. This next gentleman I discovered a number of years ago, and he absolutely devastated me. One, because he was a reincarnation of a period I was very precocious as a child. When I was preteen, I was born in 1949. I was very aware of rock and roll that was born into me, but more specifically, the beats and jazz. My father being a musician, my mother in showbiz, so it was kind of a natural thing. But the beat movement was extraordinary. And it ushered in so much that we stand on today, the shoulders of these people. And you mentioned Lawrence Ferlin Getty, God bless him. Well, this young fellow demonstrated in his own voice not a borrowing, but a continuance of eloquence that is humbling to me. I've been very fortunate to be collaboratively involved in two publications of extraordinary work, written in vain, V-E-I-N, and Ashtray Heaven. Blow your mind. I highly recommend you go up onto Amazon and check it out. Without further ado, Jared Levine. Set me up for failure with a phrase like that. You know? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll read a few poems from um, the uh, two books that have been published and a few ones that haven't been. Uh, this first one is called Whorehouse. It's from Written in Vain. God help the impatient snail who cannot handle life's pace, who sweats plasma and oozes a path on the pavement. Have mercy on the snail who needs to flee in a hurry, chased by slugs and three-toed sloths, the snail who longs to be a turtle. Bless his little heart. He don't know what he's missing. Can't smell the roses, he just chews through the petals. That snail with a house on his back, may he never want to fill it, furnish it, paint it sky blue, install vinyl siding. May he never know money or gain a clue about this world. Let that poor snail enjoy his bliss, such as it is. His pain could be so much greater if he ever were to learn what people think of snails. Terry, is it? She read a poem about um, firearms. Um, this poem was published in Ashtray Heaven, uh, but it could be applied to any of a hundred instances in recent American history. Sometimes you feel like a gun nut, sometimes you don't feel anything below the waist. My nation suffers patiently through blood transfusions. She does not whimper when her eyes water. It is only a biological reaction beyond her control, like any other randomized calamity, like the isolated, unpredictable insanity of this accident that has laid her up in ICU and could never possibly have been prevented. No matter what kind of crazy cockamamie, congressional claptrap, or sniveling bureaucratic officials coughed up <clears throat> on Capitol Hill, she is tough, rogue, imperious. 
She cleared the great western frontier with single action Winchesters and a handful of smallpox. She blazed trails of tears with her own sweat and mopped the blood of obstinate Indians with the solid red stripes of a half-mast old glory, then raised her high from the mountains to the prairies and higher from sea to shining sea in the name of Jesus, gold and freedom always freedom. No, she doesn't need your pity, your get well soon cards, your world history lessons. She will convalesce like Andrew Jackson with a bullet in her shoulder and dysentery, cannon and sabers at the ready, defiant, shielded by the Constitution, wrapped in a tactical Kevlar flag for which she will gladly bear arms and perish or weep with abandon when her anthem echoes from the farthest flung nosebleed bleacher seats. My nation longs for death by glory, martyrdom, rapturous final repose near the front lines, where salvation will be a God's will miracle, resulting in amputation and paralysis and a purple heart to show grandchildren who will thrill at the realization that school books are superfluous, that class is just the porcelain construct of wealthy elitists, that true history is taught daily in plain sight, in public spaces, where it so efficiently repeats itself as if to be truly fully automatic. On a lighter note, the philosopher's notes on time travel. I've known some people in my time, over the years, through the decades, across the indeterminate span of a life, my life perhaps, but a life shared with some people I've known, some I knew, some I still know and some I will. Our paths have crossed at perpendicular intersections, or carried on stride the simultaneity of parallel lines. Some have signaled and turned, others have steered spontaneously awry, citing the journey as destination. We have submitted our destinies to the dictates of cliché. We have followed fate's whims and whispers, made ourselves as light as autumn leaves, we have stayed the course charted by ancient mariners. The steadfast guidance of Sirius, as told by the sextant. We have sought and we have found that what we found was not what we had sought. So, here we are, you and I, people who know each other, who have sought and found each other people bonded by a flashbolt of kismet, but cursed to advance, as people always do, alone. I have been and am these people. We have been each other. We continue to travel, to grow, to seek, and we find. Change is the only constant. The cliches are inevitable. The Last Trace of Silk. This was also from Ashtray Heaven. I have found a long, lone strand of your hair on the arm of my black wool cardigan. I cannot recall the last time you have seen me in this sweater. I wonder where more hairs may be hidden, clung to my long-sleeved shirts. I wonder if this single tress will be the last I ever see of you, but I will rush home to check every garment hung in my closet. This poem is called Bless Up, which is a, uh, a Jamaican saying. 
And let the sun shine on all men, women, children, animals, and plants, and stones, and shapes, and glisten like a billion ribbony mirrors off the water. Let them then expand their cells in the warmth and bask like reptiles waiting for their blood to boil. Let the skin soften. Let the eggs sizzle and fry, the fat simmer in cast iron pans, the bacon grease pop up from the stove. Open the windows and allow the sky entrance. Make room for air as old as time to circumnavigate the stuffy kitchens and dusty attics. Let the years of crime on keepsake cardboard boxes dance in parallelograms of late morning light. There is life exhaled with each breath, set free to explore again the world it left for your body. It did its job as promised, kept your lungs oxygenated and your heart pumping, pumping to veins that throbbed in your arms and stood out against your throat, helped you swallow sustenance and excrete waste. There is life in the space between you and the sun, between yourself and me, me and tomorrow. We all drink this elixir, this shared king's cup of nectar sucked from open flowers. We are intoxicated without losing balance. We are without thought, guzzling daydreams in that interim territory. Let us linger there longer than the last time. Let us remember this warmth at the next rain and have no doubts about the source of our next breath, be it the first or last of our lives, and trust it was drawn correctly. No matter what form it chose to take, it chose to take on you just as you chose to receive it, to keep it, let it go. And these choices were as close to perfect as we will ever comprehend. This is called Exercises to Dispel Centuries Old Stereotypes About Poets. <laughs> it's really Poe and the Romantics that they are responsible for what I'm about to talk about. Think what you will of the poet. Think nothing at all if you have no thoughts. Think of a cold, damp basement or a bare bones shack, a spare, rickety space sugared with cobwebs. Think of waning candlelight, thrice used wax lighted by shaky hands. Picture a faulty quill pen, furious, scribbling. Think of ink stains and wine stains and stained teeth too late to brush. Think of poor health, tuberculosis, thin bodies weathered by pain, rocked through with coughing, chronic suffering. Think penury, Dickensian pauperism, self-pity and self-subconscious masochism. Think of the classic tortured soul the lovesick alcoholic, determined to die young. Think dramatic, the tragic, hopeless romantic. Think of Poe on permanent opium, fantasizing dead women and slick feathered blackbirds. Think of the poet dressed in black, always prepared for a funeral. Think of pockmarks, pimples, dandruff, baldness, Think of feeble, unctuous handshakes that fall away like slippery fish with downcast eyes and unbearable awkwardness. Think of the poems, the cryptic passages riddled with archaic verbiage, the rhymes you saw coming but still couldn't comprehend. Think of the kid in eighth grade who said to the teacher, I don't get it, and the whole class murmured in assent. Think of how you didn't feel so dumb after that, when the majority decided that poetry was weird, 
for old folks from olden times and far off places where people called each other thou. Think about these tropes and the types concerning who the poet is, what the poet does. Have they changed since school? Has a poet entered your life and filled it with their obsessions? Were you stricken with TB? Did the poet infect you with manic depression? Were you made penniless? Was your sexuality threatened? Did the poet drag you to the sediment pit at the bottom of a cheap bottle of bad red wine? Did you become snide, condescending, and glib? Is your soul more tortured for encountering the poet? Would you even know a poem if it slapped you in the mouth? Think. All the things you think about, all the things you feel but can't express, that is poetry. Think of all you sense and experience, all the learned lessons, acquired wisdom, and pithy advice, that is poetry. Think about love and joy, about pain and death, all poetry. Think what you will of the poet. The poet cares only you think for yourself. Amen. Yeah. This is um, a poem I read out last time I was here. Uh, it's called Ubermensch. One. Where is my hero and his gallant stretch limo? Where is his matte chrome American Express card, his platinum plated cash clip and boomerang money so gracefully thrown around? Where is my icon's thundering Lear jet, the one designed to run on charisma? Where can I purchase a replica of his famed bulletproof ego? Where is his diamond polished mirror of inconceivable flattery and the soothsayer inside who guides seekers to ceaseless wealth and power and unimpeachable tax write-offs? Tell me. Where did my hero learn the art of mastery? Who showed him the proper way to dominate those beneath him, subjugate his debtors? How many lips have flattered his marquee cut pinky finger pimp's ring or been made to brush against the well-fed, bleached blonde flesh of his butt cheek? My hero, with his Teflon shield of self-importance, his personal patented brand of narcissism, moves among us, it remains untouched. What priceless radioactive element does he bathe in? What unholy ambrosia does he substitute for coffee? What molten lava lubricant allows him to flow from triumph to triumph? Tell me. I too want my hero's parade. Name on a tall building, in gold leaf lettering, glittering like magnifying glass above a sidewalk littered with penniless ants. I, too, want to toss pennies from the penthouse and claim they fell from heaven. Two. For you are the slick one. Mont Blanc pen-wielding corporate executive prototype clad in custom Italian suits. Shoes shined by the tongues of your slavering minions. Your competitors cowed into submission. Your hair combed over with the oleaginous homage paid by your cabal of televised sycophants. You are the steel-eyed deal-maker, the iron fist with the golden touch, a machine much too busy to bother with updates. You have no time for these polysyllabic adjectives, these pleas for change, pleases and thank yous of the politesse, these people who deny your greatness. For you are the builder of fortunes, surveyor of markets. For you 
says the apprentice from the anteroom desk. It's all for you, always for you, they call. They heed your every beck and biscuit of fiscal advice. For you are the one who knows. You are the one who dictates, who lactates solvency. You, with your armory of Rolex and Breitling, your smithery of platinum tie bars, titanium golf clubs and club memberships. For you, I bring this contract, offer this piece of meat for your personal butchery. For you are the judge and executioner, the long, strong arm of the law and outstretched hand of the Lord. I beseech you, O hero, accept this blank check and let me bask in the glow of your exclusive copyright. Three. <laughs> Let's get down to business. I come for the gold, the Spanish rubies and blood-stained Kinshasa diamonds. Give up the vault code. Give me the combo. I want your condo in Costa del Sol, the Amalfi Villa in Costa Rica Hacienda. I need the Tudor Castle and the floating party yacht anchored in international waters. It's high time a new hero mounted a million dollar filly and blasted off to the races. You knew this day would come. You said as much yourself to the one you usurped, that such power only transfers in a guillotine swift coup. Did you look in your rival's eyes and snarl, there's a new sheriff in town? Sorry, babe, it's just business, nothing personal. It didn't have to end like this. But of course it did, and always does. My hero doesn't ride off into sunsets, beach sand footprints receding with the evening tide. He limps, bedraggled into poverty, anonymous, ragged, and ashamed, less concerned with his current state than the graceless fall he took to reach it. How stunned. He seems to have arrived here, where pennies litter the sidewalk, and no one cares where they came from. Uh, how much more? Oh, just a couple more. <clears throat> they ask, do not we all have teeth? Do not our teeth all have the capacity to bite? Cannot our biting tear flesh, create or rupture wounds? Have not we restrained our snarls so often, champing our tongues so as not to shed blood? Have not we all been at least once bitten, been shied and cowed at the next bared teeth? Do not the answers to these questions prompt more biting? A tongue is a slippery thing to hold close. Jaws are things made to open. They ask, is there no peace without war? No fed mouth that has not chewed? No kiss, no curse, that a smile did not preempt? Are not our teeth both beautiful and vicious? Must we always devour what we covet? Must love be so all-consuming? <laughs> the last one is called Footnote, or This is Being a Writer. This is being a writer, scribbling a few lines in a book full of scribbled lines to be placed on a shelf full of books full of scribbled lines knowing that no one is likely ever to read them, any of them. It has nothing to do with plot, character, publishing, agents, press releases, social media, fans, autographs, public readings, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, Jane Austen, James Baldwin, Ezra Pound, Sylvia Plath, David Foster Wallace, Joyce Carol Oates, or whomever, or when, or wherever, or Whatever fire your college professor lit under your idealistic adolescent behind, 
whatever inspiration you took from someone else's poetry or novel, your favorite French film or the perfect jazz record, nothing to do with exposed brick lofts in Brooklyn or sun-baked Spanish haciendas, robo hobo-centric road trips or week-long wine and weed-infused spitball sessions. It is lonely, self-absorbed, tedious, and secretive. It is about you, your work, your dedication to your craft. It does not exist until you create it. It is your time, your life, every bloody inch of it. That's all. That's all.